Welcome everybody. I'm on the horse tonight again. Nice to see everybody here, as usual. And we're looking forward to a enjoyable evening with uh, all of the intellectual people here who always have good thoughts and questions and comments to say. And as usual, we start off with our laws of Lashon Hara and the Holy Sefer, Chavetz Chaim. <clears throat> and we are up to the point where he talks about, we might have touched upon it, I, said, I think we said we'll talk about it this week. A person, we learned, is not allowed to speak Lashon Hara, speak gossip. A person is not allowed to accept Lashon Hara, not even to listen to Lashon Hara. Hear somebody talking gossip about somebody else, uh, I think I'm too busy. I've got something better to do. We don't want to hear gossip about people. But what happens if a person couldn't control his desire and he did hear Lashon Hara about somebody else and he believed it? And now he hears that you're not allowed to do that. Talk about another fellow Jew that he did something bad. Who said he did something bad? Because he said so. People say a lot of things. Doesn't mean that it's true. So what should a person do to do tshuva? We know that all of the laws of the Torah that we're not supposed to do or those we're supposed to we don't do, we have a way out to do tshuva. Repent. Of course, we usually discuss in depth the matter of tshuva, repentance around Rosh Hashanah time, Yom Kippur time. But actually, the mitzvah of tshuva, one of the mitzvahs in the Torah, is really relevant the whole year. Not only Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, but there it's very, very strong, concentrated, the mitzvah of tshuva. But there's a mitzvah of tshuva a whole year. So a person really, we're told, don't wait for Yom Kippur to do tshuva. If a person does something wrong, do tshuva right away. Yom Kippur is, for those stragglers, people who didn't do it before, we give them less chance to do tshuva and Yom Kippur. But to repent and to become better, we're told not to wait. Because first of all, I don't want to be morbid about it, because we never, the person never knows if we live till, till Yom Kippur. The person doesn't want to die without doing tshuva. Many people do tshuva every night before they go to sleep. We're told there are four times in the year to do tshuva. Every night before we go to sleep. If you think back, we were good today or not so good today. If I did something wrong, I feel bad about it. Before I go to sleep, let me fix everything up. Tell God, listen, God, today wasn't so good. I did something. But tomorrow, tomorrow's going to be a great day. At the end of the week, before Shabbat, before Shabbos, the end of the week, we should go back and reflect on our actions of the whole week. And coming to the holy day of Shabbos, which is the day we're so close to Hashem, so close to God, from the act of tshuva. Then, the third time is the end of the month. Before the new month comes, we want to enter everything, anything that's new, the new day, the new week, the new month. As a matter of fact, some people fast the last day of the month before Rosh Chodesh, called Yom Kippur Katan, called Yom Kippur, called the small Yom Kippur, that they say special prayers before the new month, the end, last day of the old month, before the new month. If you look at the Siddur, you'll see last day it says Yom Kippur Katan, the small Yom Kippur. They say special prayers. Something very similar to the prayers we say in Yom Kippur, not as long, much shorter, but there are certain prayers that are the same. And some people even fast, as a matter of fact, the last day, just like Yom Kippur. And then, of course, we have the end of the year, beginning of the new year, when we have the time to do tshuva. So tshuva is relevant any time, all the time. So if a person wants to do tshuva because he accepted Lashon Hara, what should he do? Well, the three steps of tshuva, as we know, the first step is we have to feel bad for what we did. 
We always talk about it before Yom Kippur, the three steps of tshuva. Feel bad for what we did wrong. Take upon ourselves to do the right thing. And we misvada, and we say out, Chotosi, I sinned. We, we uh, confess to Hashem that we sinned. Those are three steps of tshuva. But before we can come to those three steps, we have to stop doing the, the sin that we're doing. There's nothing to do with tshuva if a person keeps doing the sin all the time. He's doing the same thing. So what's the person who's doing tshuva? A person who's uh, speaking Lushan all the time, wow, he's not doing tshuva. So the same thing when it comes to a, the matter of tshuva for accepting Lushan. The first thing we have to do is to try our best to uproot from our thoughts about what we heard about that person. We heard bad about him, we accepted it, and we looked down upon him now because he did something wrong. Now we have to go back to Tshuva. Who says he did it? Because he told me he did it. We know a lot of rumors go around, people talk. It means nothing. And if he did do it, we don't know the circumstances, what led him to do it. Maybe so-and-so happened. Maybe he was sick. Maybe he had to do it for a certain reason. He had a good reason for what he did. But to take away the bad feeling and not to believe bad about the person. That's what we have to do, the first thing, do to Tshuva. Once we do that, then we can say, okay, God, now please forgive me for accepting the beginning. I take upon myself not to do it anymore. And a person confesses they did wrong. And that's tshuva. Now, it's forbidden to accept Lashonar about somebody else, even if there are many people who are, are present when Lashonar is being spoken. He might first say to himself, what the person, what's wrong with him? I mean, if it's not true what he's saying, what he said in front of so many people, if I'd be by myself, he'd say, okay, he's not so careful what he says because it's only one person. Well, let's say it's a whole crowd of people. He gets up and says that to a crowd of people, something bad about somebody else. Is he lying? Is it not true? It must be true. No. Some people are not careful. Even if it's said in front of a crowd, we still are forbidden to accept the Lashon Hara that he's saying. Even if the person is standing there, they say, you know that person? Say, you know what he did? So they say, he meant chutzpah, to say a lie in front of him? It must be true. How can he say in front of a person something that did bad? And he's standing there. If it's not true, it must be true. It doesn't help. Even if the person standing doesn't react, the person standing doesn't say anything. And we know, as on Tereto Chavetz Chaim, this person in the past, when he said something bad about him, in front of him, he reacted and he got said, what are you talking about? It's, it's a lie, I never did that. And now he's quiet, he didn't say anything. So he said, it must be true. Number one, right in front of him he's talking. How would he have the chutzpah to say in front of him it's not true? Number two, he didn't react. It must be true. Could be the person who's being spoken about had very, very deep thoughts about himself. It took upon himself that he's not going to react. People embarrass him in public. He takes upon himself that he's not going to react. You never know what a person's thinking. It's no proof by the fact that he kept quiet and didn't react to the person's lush and horror that it's true. He can't accept it. So now we're saying, even in front of a lot of people, even in front of the person himself, even the person himself didn't react, you cannot accept it to be true. Lush and horror. And the same thing applies if we heard Lush and horror from more than one person. More than one person said the same Lush and horror about the other person. So he said, two people said it already. Two people considered kosher. Witnesses, two people say something about somebody else, if I'm from one person making a mistake. Two people. No, 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 no. The only time we have kosher witnesses, two people, they have to come to court in front of a court of law, Jewish court, and come say testimony in front of the judges, in front of the people that are involved in the whole case that we're talking, then they consider it kosher witnesses. But just outside talking, people are talking, you can have 100 people talking. They're not considered 
Eidus. It's not considered witnesses that are reliable. They must say it in front of a court. In front of a court, people are scared of a court. Just to talk like this in front of people doesn't make, doesn't faze them. So what if they say things? So we cannot rely on them. They're not considered kosher edim. Not considered kosher witnesses unless the testimony is said in front of an official based in, of three judges at least. So we have tonight, even if a person said it in front of many people, even if the person standing there, even though the person was quiet, even though two people said it, we cannot accept it to be true. Our good Jewish friend that's being spoken about, I'm not with Kabul. I don't accept Loshner about him. He's so good. He's such a good person. He's got God's creation. It's going to take much more than that for me to accept bad slander or gossip about it. That's how we have to feel to somebody else. Okay. Now, getting back to our subject, we started before Shavuos, and we're still discussing, and we called tonight's Shmuz, that the Jews really need the threat of a mountain crashing down upon them to get them to accept the Torah. As we have the number one in the glossary sheet, Kof Alem Gigis. We said last week we weren't to speak about this. Contradiction. God took Mount Sinai and held it over them and said, if you'll take the Torah, good, and if not, that's where you'll be buried. It's the end of it. The end of the world. End of the Jews, end of the world. And, number two, poi, take for us. This will be your burial place. You must take the Torah. They have a choice. Take a gun, put a person and said, accept. Yeah, accept, of course I accept. So they had a choice. Did they have any choice? Was it really necessary? Number three, Nasev and Ishma. The Jewish people said, Moses came down, Moshe Rabbeinu from Harsina, from God, and said, will you accept the Torah? And he said, Naseh v'nishma. We will do, and we will accept, and we will understand. He went to the nations of the world and asked them, will you accept the Torah? Number five, the nations of the world said, Maxim, what's written in the Torah? You want us to accept it? What's written there? Now, the Jews didn't say what's written. They didn't ask any questions. It's Nasev and Ishma. We will do what we have to do, and then we will understand what we're doing. So they were above, again, ahead of the nations of the world, doublefold. Number one, they didn't ask God what's written in the Torah. They, that's what's written there. You want the Torah from God? Yes. God wants to give it to us. We're accepting it. We don't have to ask him what's written there. We don't have to, what's, who cares what's written there? God wants us to do it. He'll tell us to do it. Number two, even after we find out what we're supposed to do, we're not going to ask why. Why should we do that? God said so. Must be good. Like a child, his parents, if it's a good child, he'll say, Mommy, Daddy told me to do it, I'll do it. I understand it, but if you say so, I know I can trust you because you take care of me. Did everything for me. So obviously, if you tell me to do something, it must be for my good. A child is not such a great child, like most children. Start questioning why, what I have to do that for. It doesn't make any sense. I don't know. See, so the Jewish people were like the good child, and the nations of the world were like the not such great child. Why? What's written there? I brought down the words of Isaiah, the prophet, number four, Yeshaya Novi, Kiloi Machshavaisai, Machshavaisaychem. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. Can we really understand God's thoughts? Why? You go to a doctor, you don't feel good. So, the doctor, take this medicine. Why? The doctor said, Why? Go to medical school for 10 years and you'll find out why. Who is a doctor? Why should take this? Why is the medicine going to help me? You have trust in the doctor. Take the medicine. Take the medicine. You have to find out why it's going to help. 
you know that he knows what he's talking about. He studied about it. And he recommends and prescribes this medication. So I trust him and I take it because he said so. Some the doctor himself doesn't know why. Certain reactions we have to certain medication. Even doctors don't know why, but it helps, whatever the reason is. Same thing. God said to the Jewish people, you want the Torah? He said, yes. If you say so, whatever you give is good. We understand it. We don't have to understand. Nase, we will, ex we will live and abide by the Torah. We'll do what we're supposed to do. Whatever you tell us, we'll do it. Venishma, and later we'll understand it. We'll study it. God wants us to understand it. He wants us to delve into the Torah, to learn the reasons, to try the best of, of our ability to understand Torah. Nase, Venishma, we'll understand it afterwards. We'll study, we'll delve into it, and we'll understand them and get a, a, a good understanding of what God wants from us. But we don't have to understand before we do. We'll do it because it's right, because God says so. That's good enough for me. That's how the Jews said at that time. So, if that's the case, our question is, why do you have to hold the Torah over the, hold the mountain over the Jewish people? By the way, I have down over here number six, that the nations of the world, God came to Esau, Edom, that's the nation of the children of Esau, the son of Yitzchak, the brother of Yaakov. And he said, Max, see, but what's written in the Torah? That, that was the first mistake they made. The God said, you're disqualified. You're asking me what's written there. You're asking me what's written. What's the difference? If I want to give it to you. So God answered, you're not allowed to kill. Ten commandments, you're not allowed to kill. It's not, it's not for us. You can't, can't accept the Torah. Because our great, great grandfather Yitzchak told us, if you remember, when he gave the brachas, he gave out the blessings to Yaakov and Esau, he said, you will live by the sword. So if we live by the sword, what can you tell us? The Lord said, don't kill. Now what does that mean? How is that possible? You mean Yitzchak told Esau to go around killing people? Live by the sword? Shouldn't keep the, the word, the Ten Commandments, not to kill? There's a seven, one of the seven Noahite laws, never mind Ten Commandments. One of the seven Noahite laws is not you're not allowed to kill. Other Mauritian was Adam and Eve were commanded. Noah was commanded. Everybody, was all nations of the world, every person alive, Jew and non-Jew, is commanded. Lord sits and not allowed to kill, and not allowed to murder. So you mean Yitzchak told Esav, al you should live by the sword, but go kill people. Of course he didn't mean that. What he meant was that if you will have problems with your neighbors and they will unjustly come and try to take your land away from you. If you have people coming and doing bad things to you and you have to stand up for your rights. So if, if there's no other resort, you have to go to war, you should be successful. Live by your sword. In other words, when war comes your way, which cannot be avoided, so you'll be successful in your fight against your enemies. That's what Yitzchak meant, al But Esav took it a little further than that, that, well, if we gave, gave such a blessing that we'll be successful with our sword, with our, with, our, with our army, with our battles, we'll go a little further than that. And we'll start off with other people, take their land away from them. And we'll... Uh, be successful because we have the blessing of our great Yitzchak, Isaac, the great patriarch of, 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 of Esau. He also came from Yitzchak. We'll go a little further. He, went, he wanted us to have a certain self-defense. But we'll be a little aggressive and we'll go and take other people's land. We'll fight others, start wealth with them and we'll be successful. That's what we're talking about over here. Lo Yitzchak. Do not kill. And then we can't, we can't keep that Esau said because we have the sword as a blessing from our, from our great grandfather, from Yitzchak. So therefore, they made two mistakes. God went to all the nations of the world and asked them all different questions. They asked what's written there. I'm just picked on one of Esau. 
And uh, that was two mistakes. First of all, asking what's written there. If God wants to give it to you, what are you asking what's written there? And then you say, don't want to accept it. Now you know what's written there. You don't want to accept it. They're all disqualified. The only people, Jewish, Jewish people said, Nasev and Nishma. We accept it. We'll do. We don't know what it is, but we'll find out later. And when we find out, we don't have to necessarily know why. A lot of people ask, why can't you eat pork? What's wrong with eating pork? Jewish people can't eat pork. Because, they say, because years ago, they had all kinds of diseases in the pork, and that's, that's all baloney. There's no such thing. That's not the reason why you not eat pork. Don't let anybody talk you into that. Why the uh, Shabbos, keep Shabbos, because you have to rub two stones together. It was a lot of work, but today you just put a light on. That's all false information. It's not a And God told us we have to keep Shabbos, whether they understand it, we don't understand it, it makes no difference. Of course, they all have reasons. If people study about it, people start to find out. So, our question is a very strong question. The Jews said, Nasev and Nishma, we're accepting it. Why did God have to take the mountain over the head? If you take it good, and if not, that's where you'd be buried. They accepted it. What are you threatening them for? And there are many answers given to this. And the answer is very, very important for us to learn and to live by. The first answer I want to discuss is number seven. Torah hi muchvachas. God wants to show the Jewish people it's very nice, you want to accept the Torah, but don't think it's something up to you to accept. You have to realize that Torah is, is a must. If you don't want it, you have to take it anyway. Because without Torah, there's no life, like we discussed the last few, last few weeks. It's like a doctor telling a child, I want you to take your vitamins, because if you don't take your vitamins, you'll get sick, you can die. And the child says, oh, of course, oh, I love this. Oh, they're, they're so tasty, give that, give, give that, that flavor, those vitamins, sure I like them. I'll take the vitamins, of course. But the doctor says, don't think only when you like it. Maybe later, maybe when you won't like them anymore, you still have to take it, you better take it. If you don't take it, you can get very sick. Who knows what's going to happen? So sometimes it's not enough for us to say, oh, I want to do it because it's a nice thing. God's saying if it's nice or not nice. It might come time, times in your life that you don't, not so comfortable with the Torah, not so comfortable with being Jewish. It may be difficult, but you have to keep it anyway. This is what I am demanding from you, the Jewish people, to keep the Torah whether good times or difficult times, whether you're in the mood, you're not in the mood, whether it's geschmack, it's good, it's, it's, it's tasty, it's, 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 it's inviting, it makes a difference. You have to keep the Torah no matter what. That's why God said, the very nice, he said, Nasa we're going to accept it, we're going to do. And then I took them out and said, are you going to take it now? In other words, you must take it. Don't fix it because you want to. Some Torah is something that is a must. It's not just if you feel like today you feel like, tomorrow you don't feel like. Like the vitamins we said before. This is essential for the life of the world, for the life of the Jewish people. Torah is the basis of life, of creation. Without Torah, there's no creation. Like we discussed the last few weeks in, at great length. I'd like to bring down in number eight, a story that's told in the, uh, we say now since Pesach, every Shabbos afternoon, say Pirke Ovis, called Chapters of the Fathers. All very deep expressions of understanding of basics of Judaism. But here at the end, it says over a story. Omar, Rabbi Yosei ben Kismo. Rabbi Yosei, the son of Kismo, said the following. Pam achas, hoyisi mahalach baderach. I was once traveling on the way, and I met a certain person. And he gave me shalom. I gave shalom back to him. Shalom, shalom. 
And he said to me, Rebbe, which city do you come from? They didn't know each other from before. So I told him, Meir Gedoyla Shal Chachamim Shal Tzayfim Rebbe. I come from a city which has many scholars and many people knowledgeable in Torah study. That's where I hail from. That's where I live. So he said, Rebbe, if you want, please, come and live in our city. I see that you're a great man, a righteous man, a scholar. I'm inviting you to come to our city where we live, and I'll give to you, I will give to you hundreds of thousands of gold coins, gems, and diamonds. He was a very rich man, and he knew he had a winner over here. He said, you come to our city, and I will give you all these riches. You'll become a rich man, a multimillionaire. Well, he said, some people would say, well, that's a, that's a great offer. Uh, why not? Mighty lover, I said to him, no. Im ato, that's what we have in our sheet over here, number eight. Im ato noisenli, kol zov, v'chesef, v'mpon tovetz mel shabayl. Even if you give them to me all of the silver, all of the gold, all of the gems, and all of the diamonds in the world, and you don't have a Torah, I will not live in another place except in the place of Torah. I come from a city that's full of scholars, Torah scholars, and great pious people. That is everything to me. Gold and silver, all these things, means nothing to me. Why? First of all, he said, King David says in Psalms, in Psalm number 119, to be exact, King David, a king. We know what kings, most kings are. Most kings want a lot of money, a lot of fame, a lot of land, a lot of armies. What does a king want? Well, David, King David was different from other kings. King David says in Psalms, Toibli Torah Spicha, my Alpha is Alpha Chesed. He says to God, Your Torah is more important to me than all the gold and silver. That's coming from the king. So he told him, King David said it. I say the same thing. Not only that, when a person dies, they don't bring along. You ever see going to a funeral that they bring along a big truck loads of the person's money and his gold, his silver, his ornaments, his jewelry? They don't bring that along. They don't put it in the grave with him. No gems, no diamonds, no gold, no silver. That's not going to, he'll have to leave that. All his good friends, he has to leave in this world. What goes along with him? All of the good deeds that he did, the Torah that he studied, the commands that he did, the kindness that he did to other people. That's what goes along to a person. When a person comes in front of the holy throne of Hashem, we all have to face God, our Creator, when we pass from the world and come to the other world, God is going to put us in front of him. And say, Yankala, my good son, what you, did you bring along with you? You have a lot of gold and silver. You got a lot of diamonds. You got the gems. God's not going to ask that. He doesn't care anything about how much riches a person had. He's going to ask him, how many good deeds did you do? What kind of life did you live? Were you a good person? Were you a good Jew? Did you do what you're supposed to do as a good Jew? That's what God's going to ask. So therefore, he told this person, I'm not impressed with all these offers of riches that you want to give to me because in your place there's nobody for me to be able to talk to in Torah study, to be able to relate to. I want to be in a place with great scholars, great pious people. Those are the people I want to, I want to live with. So we're talking over here that Torah is mochrach, Torah is a must to the Jewish nation. Contrary to many people's ideas, the Torah is a nice thing, it's a, beautiful thing, the Jewish people accept it, but it's not for me. It's for everybody. Torah is for everybody. Not one Jewish person that was ever born that can say Torah is not for me. Torah is for all of us to study, to love, to enjoy, to, to, to delve into, to understand, to practice, to teach our children. This is what Torah is all about. 
So God wanted to tell the Jewish people, very nice, you accepted the Torah, but I want you to know, the Torah is mukhrach, the words over here, Torah is a must. It's not just if we feel like, and when we're in a good mood, it's okay, and with different mood, it's not okay. It's relevant for all a person's life, for every second of our life. That's number one. I put, put number nine, quoting King David. The Torah of God's mouth that he spoke to us in Mount Sinai and in the, in the desert afterwards for 40 years, the Torah that God gave us better. King David himself, one of the greatest people who ever lived, king. God's word, that was important to him. As a matter of fact, in one of the songs of, in Tehillim and Psalms that King David says, he says, please God, don't bother me and get me involved with wars with other nations. Other kings want to go to war to show their might, to show their greatness and show that they're able to conquer. King David was a very strong, outstanding king, very smart, very tactful. Please, God, don't get me bothered with all this. I don't want the fame. I don't want all this to show everybody. I just want to be able to stay and study your Torah. That's what I want. King David. He doesn't want all this, what other kings want. As a matter of fact, he says, Imagine that. When he got together, he used to get kings, used to get together to have meetings together to, to discuss different international affairs. The different kings got, and King David attended naturally. He spoke the words of Torah to them while they were talking about different important ideas, which he took part in also. But he told them different words of Torah to them. It was about the Noahite laws, because he was so in, 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 in immersed in the words of Torah, the thoughts of Torah. Everybody around him was able to enjoy the warmth that he had to show what Torah has for, for people. Now, that was one answer for this question that we have. Why did God have to force them to take the Torah? I have two more answers over here. One, I'll say, I'll say them briefly. Number one, well, the number two as far as tonight's discussion goes. There is two parts to the Torah, and many, many people don't realize. The Torah Sheb Eksab, we have number 10. Torah Sheb Al Peh, the oral Torah. Everybody knows God gave the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. That's a known thing. Some people even know that God gave all the mitzvahs of the Torah on Mount Sinai. But they don't realize that together with that Torah was an oral Torah. Words that were given over that were not written down for many years to come. Later they were written down ultimately. But for many, for thousands of years, there was an oral Torah that explained the written Torah. Because without the oral Torah, we cannot understand the written Torah. God says, you should make sukkah, make a sukkah. Sit in the sukkahs. We have a, how do you, what is a sukkah? How do you make a sukkah? What is it? It doesn't say the Torah what it is. We have the oral Torah that God gave to Moses just as well to tell him how to make a sukkah. Eat matzah. What's matzah? What is it? It doesn't say what matzah is in the Torah. Everybody knows matzah. Everybody knows what matzah is, but what does it say in the term? What, what is, maybe it means some kind of, a, some kind of, a, some kind of meat. Some kind of, what is it? We have to have some to explain all these laws of the Torah. Otherwise, you don't know what, what they mean. And the written Torah is limited to the five books of Moses that we have Bereshis, Shemais, Vayikra, Bamirva, Devarim. We have Genesis, and Exodus, and Leviticus. Numbers, Deuteronomy, the five books. And that's limited. Exactly what's written there, that was given to Moses. But the oral Torah is unlimited. Explanation, discussion, understanding, delving. That's the Talmud we call the Gemara. I don't know how many of you have ever tasted the delicious experience of studying Gemara, studying the, the oral law, the great discussions that went on in the yeshivas over the generations 
of the greatest minds of the world who discussed and delved into the laws of the Torah. So, there is one opinion that says that the Jewish people accepted the Tarsh of Iksab, the written law, because it's not so, it's limited. It's five books, 613 laws, but the oral law is so deep and so wide and extensive that they weren't ready to take. That was too much. Really. So our law that's on and on so many different things. That's mountain cover, uh-uh. You accept the written law, you better take the oral law also. Otherwise, I know it's good for you, God's saying. Maybe some of you think that's too much, it's too deep, it's too extensive, but I know it's good for you. And I'm telling you, as my Jewish nation, as my children, the ones who I love in this world, my Amsegula, the nation of God's special feeling and, and, and purpose for creation, I'm telling you, I'm forcing you to take it. Just like a parent will force a child to do something that's good for them, take this medicine, and you force them to take it because it's good for them. God forced to put it to his people. And a third answer to this question. The Jewish people accepted the Torah. True. But we study at the time the Torah was given, there was fire on the mountain. There was thunder and lightning. What is this fire? What is, what is that all about? Fire of the Torah. One of the ideas of the fire was the idea to the Jewish people that accepting the Torah is a very great responsibility. And like all things in the world, the greater responsibility, the greater the opportunity, with that comes responsibility and possible embarrassment if a person does not live up to his responsibility. The President of the United States has such a great opportunity, the strongest man in the world today, to do so many good things in the world. Peace, economy, hunger, nature, he has a lot to do. But if he doesn't do what he's supposed to do, if he gets into trouble, then his downfall is terrible. Then the whole world looks at him. What did you do? Like some president recently were embarrassed. They don't act properly. Then the embarrassment is terrible. If a private person does something, eh? But if you're in such a position of greatness and opportunity and responsibility and you don't live up to what you're supposed to do, so then comes along with that a lot of responsibility of of, of downfall, of embarrassment. And God told the Jewish people, I'm giving you this Torah, this Torah which is so great, and so wonderful, and so sweet. But the responsibility is tremendous. With that fire that they saw, they saw the Inquisition, they saw pogroms, they saw the Crusades, they saw the Holocaust, that was the fire, represents the fire. You have to keep this Torah I'm giving you. It's wonderful, it's great, it's important, it's the best thing in the world. But you have to realize the responsibility. If you don't live up to it, so then the repercussions are very, very great. And that's what they got scared, frightened. Wonderful Torah, we sure we accept the Torah, but then God showed them, but look what comes along with the Torah. Then they say, oh, that's too much, we can't. Too much. Holocaust. Inquisition. And all the Torahs the Jews suffered throughout the ages. Too much. God said, no. Took the mountain and said, you're going to accept it anyway. You're going to take the responsibility. You don't have to have a Holocaust. You don't have to have Inquisition. Keep it, live it, do it, learn it and you'll be happy, it won't have any problems. I'm telling you, it's the best thing for you. 
And even if you don't keep it, and you go through all these things, you go through Holocaust, and positions, and crusades, and programs, but the end will be, it will be worthwhile. You don't have to. If you do what you're supposed to do, you'll be okay. Just in case you don't, it'll still be worth it. Because you'll get through it, like the Jews have done throughout the ages. We went through all the positions, and went through all the programs, and went through the Holocaust, and we're alive today, and we're thriving. And Torah is very, very rich in so many places today. People studying Torah, people adhering to the laws of the Torah, doing. We made it. We're still around. We're alive and well. God promised. Looks hard. Looks difficult. You want to back out? I'm not going to let you back out. Because I know at the end of it's going to be good. To end off with this, I'm saying now, we say in our psalms before we say benching on Shabbos and Yom Tov, Shir HaMalos. Everyone knows that song to Shir HaMalos, right before the bench, before we praise God for the food that gave us. Shir HaShem HaShir HaTzin, when God will return, the returning of the Jewish people to the Holy Land, when Mashiach will come, Hayinu HaKechalmin, will be like dreamers. The good times will come again. The bad times will be over with forever. And we'll look back and look at all the terrible things that happened to the Jews. It'll be like a dream, like a bad dream. But it's over with. Look at now. Eternity, forever, will be in a good way. Everything will be fine. We'll go to Hashem close to God and we'll get our reward. And we'll look back, it was all worth it. Even though at the time it seems impossible. But we got through it. And then when the time comes that God will give our eternal reward, we'll look back and say, it was all worth it. Those people went through it. We believe the people who died will come to alive again. They'll get up and say, it was worth it. They'll see the goodness of what's happening afterwards for eternally. That was only for a year, two years. People suffered. But now they'll be able to live forever, eternally. It'll all be, all be worth it. So that's another one of the answers why God had to force them because they didn't have the feeling to the extent of what Judaism really is. And they got scared off with the responsibilities. And God told them, I'm telling you, I'm forcing you to take it for your good. Because you're going to eventually, ultimately, realize the greatness of the goodness of the Torah. So these are, are the uh, three answers that we gave to the, to the reason why they had to be forced even though they accepted it, number one, God wanted to show them it's not only because you wanted it, it's, it's a must. Number two, because he wanted them to take the oral law besides the written law. And number three, they were very apprehensive because of the great responsibility that they saw. God had to push them into that also. Sometimes parents have to put, force children into things that are they, so difficult. First, but for a child going to school for the first time, I'm sure all the experience of a child going to, for the first time, they're crying, they want to go. You have to push him in to go, because that's the best thing for them. Oh, they're crying, the poor kid, leave him alone, let him stay home. You want to go away from mommy, go away for the first time? No, you have to force him to go. I, they're crying, how could you do that? You know that's the best thing for them. And throughout their life, different challenges children have, and they're afraid, parents have to push him into it. And they know for the best, Ultimately, that's for the, for the best of the, for the, for the good. So, we'll open up now the floor for any questions somebody might have or comments. Yeah, you were mentioning the, you know, the oral Torah and the uh, written Torah. Right. And you, you've explained this before, you know, it's not the, um, the uh, you brought up good points, like when they said matzer. What is matzer? Well, how did anybody figure out what matzah was, or how anything was, or what it was, because it was just a name and what did it represent? How did anybody, how did anybody either figure it out, or how it, did, did how, how was that evolved? That that part, like that's, exactly what I'm, that's the oral law God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. So, so, so the explanation gave, of what matzah is, what a sukkah is, oh, he, all of, oh, all he, of these mitzvahs in the written law were explained by the oral law. So when he went up to the mountain, he got. He also, he got oral law from... from exactly, from, from, exactly, from, exactly. 
as well. Now, the uh, written law, that, I mean, the Ten Commandments came down from the, the, the Mount Sinai. Right. Now, the Torah, how did, did that also come from Mount Sinai? Because there's also somebody said like... Everything came from Mount Sinai. And they said God gave to Moses everything in Mount Sinai. Because they said like the Ten Commandments was part of the Torah, but then it yeah. was given as, as a separate entity or something? It was given by God's word that he said the Ten Commandments. He gave out the Ten Commandments, but then Moses went up yeah. to the mountain and he accepted God gave him everything. The whole Ten Commandments with all the 613 laws written and their explanation. So Moses, and he gave him the Torah at the same time? Yes. Okay, thanks a lot. And, and this bush they're talking about, is that considered what they used to call the burning bush of when? No, 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 no. Burning that, bush was, uh, that's, that's it, that's something was before, before the Jews went out of Egypt. Moses was in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, in, in the, in, in the midbar in the desert, taking care of the sheep, and God appeared to him in a burning bush, just before they went out of Egypt even. That's, that was a different thing. Oh. Also a fire, but there was, this is a fire in Mount Sinai. It was much greater than the fire in the burning bush. I, I, I just want to know. All right, thank you very much. Yes. Okay, we have an online question. Um, question from a viewer. Shmuel from New Jersey wants to know, earlier today, somebody was auctioning off his Olam Haba on eBay. <laughs> um, we just looked. It was just pulled off. It was pulled off in the last couple of minutes. <laughs> Somebody wants to sell his Elam Abba on eBay. Somebody is selling his world to come. His, his reward, the world, his eternal reward is auctioning off on eBay. What, do, what did he want to do? What did he want to do with the money? Um, he, I don't think he wrote that. Uh -huh. um, I think God this like bit that, that I saw was nine hundred ninety thousand dollars, but it's been pulled. So they want to, they want you to comment. They'd like uh, Rabbi Mintz to comment on that. To comment on that. Uh, first of all, a guy like that, I don't know if he has any world to come to sell. <laughs> so. I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put any money down until God, came, until, until God himself comes and says, yeah, you can get something to buy because if somebody wants to give up and sell him my book. There was a great rabbi in Europe who did exactly that. He said, I'll sell my eternal world to come for a certain amount of millions of dollars. And he wanted to use it for Jewish projects. Jewish people in Europe at the time were suffering from pogroms and different things, and he wanted to invest the money in a certain country and give them a place to go and to have peace. So he was willing to give up his world to come in order to make things comfortable for the Jewish nation. So I don't know if that's what this person had in mind or not, but uh, I don't think nobody bought it from him. Right? Nobody had enough money to buy it from him. But this guy, was he, did somebody bought it or not? You don't know. What? It was pulled off the side. Pulled off the side. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, here we have. Give way to the high spirit. What? Give way to the high spirit. Yeah. <laughs> That's the best one I heard for a long time. Um, the uh, Israelites complained about everything. They, well, they, you know, Ooh. they weren't satisfied with the food and they weren't satisfied with the, How come they accepted the Torah? It seems out of character that they said yes. <laughs> I gave a whole lecture about this in this yeshiva, the last Shabbos in yeshiva, in front of, of a lot of Torah scholars. Maybe I could dedicate next week's. I mean, it's hard to explain on one foot. I'll say that the people in the desert are called the Dor Deya, the generation of knowledge. They were the greatest people who ever lived. Imagine, they accepted the Torah Mount Sinai. God came down to them and spoke to them. The greatest of the great. Whatever they thought, we can understand. They thought a different level, a different plateau, a different elevation. Their ideas and their actions were so above us that we cannot even think in the, their terms. They were, to the extent, I think we mentioned a few weeks ago that, yeah, we mentioned a few weeks ago that the time of the giving of the Torah, they went back to the level of Adam and Eve when they were created in the Garden of Eden. They had such a great elevation at the time the Torah was given. So now you said they complained about everything. 
we understand the complaints was not the way we had to complain about things, about food. It was very spiritual. It's spiritual ideas in mind, which I, it's a little difficult to go into right now. Maybe we'll, we'll dedicate a, a tishmuz for that. But we have to understand these were not just people looking for good food, looking for a good time. They had very spiritual ideas in mind when they complained about these. And not enough spirituality, they're really saying. We want more spirituality. It's not enough. Even on the surface, it looks like food, but it's really food for the soul, not food for the body. And uh, this is what you have to understand. They were the greatest of the great. So it says they were crying. They came to them crying. We don't, have enough, we, don't have, we, we don't have enough food to eat. I said to the boys in the shiva, you boys sometimes complain about the food. I never saw you even crying about it. They can complain about food in the yeshiva. Nobody cries about it. And they're the greatest people crying about the food. No, there's something much more to food that they wanted. Something spiritual in food that they wanted, which can't go right. But we have to think in different terms of what they were thinking of their life. So then, when so you're saying it was symbolic. What's written in the Torah is another well, level it's, to it's, read it at. It, it's it's like you always give. I always give this. You heard it from me many times. There's ice, there's water, and the steam. It's the same thing, but it's. They wanted food. It says, well, it's not symbolic. They were talking about food. But what they wanted out of that food is something much different that we want out of food. Something in food. God created the world, and he created people who have to eat food. What was the real purpose of God to made the food? created the world with food, with eating? They're much higher thoughts than this would seem to be on the surface. There's much deeper meanings to that. Maybe one of these times we'll, we'll discuss it. But we just have to realize, you like to hear that, huh? Yeah? Okay. I want, I want yeah. to hear Oh, okay. We'll, we'll come to it one of these days. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, yeah. Earlier we discussed the laws of Loshan Hara. Yes. If one happened to listen to Loshan Hara and then subsequently he regrets and he says, I have sinned. I was surprised that it seemed to be enough, so to speak, meaning that the person doesn't have to go in and ask for forgiveness against that party against which the Loshan Hara was spoken. Should the person go and ask for forgiveness every time he happens to hear Loshan Hara, or it's enough to say to Hashem, I have sinned and I'm not going to do it again, I regret it sincerely in my heart? Well. What we discussed tonight, if a person wants to do tshuva, if he will change his opinion about the person for good, that he does not ask any forgiveness. Not only that, the person we spoke about before, the person speaking Lashon Hara, does he have to ask forgiveness from the person he spoke about? It's very difficult to tell somebody, you know, I spoke Lashon Hara about you, I said you're this, I said that. one of the hardest things to do. So Al Chafetz Chaim tells us that if we want to get out of that and be free from going and, and embarrassing ourselves and telling us I spoke Lashon Hara about you, please forgive me. If we could go back to the person we spoke to and tell him, you know, I made a mistake. It was silly for me to speak to Lashon Hara because he's not, I found out that really wasn't true and really was a real reason why he did it and, uh, and wasn't, he was not bad for what he did. If we can change the person's opinion that we spoke about, we gave him a bad name and now we're able to change that so we don't have to go and ask for forgiveness anymore because there's nothing to forgive about. But so if we can't do that, that's a whole controversy about that. So should I, am I allowed to go to tell somebody for my personal uh, forgiveness and make that person feel bad? So I spoke to Lashnar about you did, about me, spoke to what did you say about me? Oh, uh, you know, it's, it's a very difficult thing to do. So the best thing is not to speak at the beginning, but if we do speak, the next best thing is to go and rectify what we did and try to change the person's opinion. If we made a, gave them a bad opinion about the person, now to try to change it and he won't feel bad, he won't think badly about the person anymore. Thank you. That's the words of the Chavetz Chaim. That, that's a very important point because I yeah. oftentimes was thinking I should be running around to people and saying, I happen to overhear Loshan Karab mm -hmm. against you. And no. that would have no. been putting other people in a bad light in the way yeah. that these yeah. people spoke. And you make the person feel very bad. And the person would feel yeah. bad, and I would look like an idiot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, 
So if you don't believe Lashon Hara, you're free. So it's better not to believe. And every time you hear Lashon Hara, maybe on the on the counter side, one should basically s look for positives right, in this person. Right, 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 right. Try to improve the opinion of the person. Right. As an offset. Right. Okay. Thank you. We have an online question from Eli. He wants to know. I think this came up several months ago, maybe a year ago. Um, how is a person supposed to know who's a real rabbi? First, how, how was the person supposed to know who was a real rabbi? Now, I don't know exactly what the person means when he says that, a real rabbi. Um, I guess, for number one, that he is uh, knowledgeable. I once said to my doctor many years ago, I said to him, exactly this point, I said to him, to us, laymen, a person with the name of a doctor, he's a doctor. A doctor's a doctor. But you as a doctor, you know who's a real doctor because you went to medical school with him. You know who cheated on their exams. You know who studied. You know who's really a doctor. The guy just passed because he just went through it and didn't really study and become a real doctor. You know the doctors that really put themselves into it, really knowledgeable, and the ones we should really go to. He said, yes, that's true. That's true. You won't say it so fast, but it's true. So I said... But to you, same thing by a rabbi. To you, a rabbi is a rabbi, said the doctor. But we as rabbis, we know the guys who really study. We the guys who really know the stuff, the ones who can rely on. So the person asking the question is, probably means who's a real rabbi. Number one, a real rabbi, a person who you can depend on to ask the words of the Torah, what God wants from us, I guess that's what we call a real rabbi. A real rabbi, he means... Who can we go to and rely on that we, if we ask him something, he's saying what God wants us to do. It's not from his own thoughts or from his own uh, uh, reasoning that he has, re he has on the agenda. He's telling over what God wants him to say. I imagine that's what they mean by a real rabbi. How is what a real rabbi? A rabbi who's really there, who wants to and does give over God's will to the people who ask him questions. Now, the per who, who kind of rabbi is that? He has to be very knowledgeable in Torah law and Torah study. And he has to be also a God-fearing person, a pious person. Those are the two ingredients who make a real rabbi. He knows his stuff. He studies. He studied. He studies. And he is pious. And he's very uh, tzaddik. And, and he's very, very uh, God-fearing person. So that's a real rabbi. So uh, usually... When you speak to a rabbi, you can tell. If you ask him something and tell it a few times, you can uh, find out to see how knowledgeable he is and how pious he is, how sincere he is. If it's hard to know that, you have to go to somebody who might not be a real rabbi, but he knows who rabbis are. There's certain laymen who also know who the real rabbis are, who maybe the person himself doesn't know. You go to a certain city, you don't know who's who, but you have a friend over there who lived there for a few years or a certain neighborhood, we want to know who a real rabbi is. You go to people living there and, and uh, dealt with the rabbis in the area and to know who the real rabbis are. Of course, uh, uh, as an Orthodox Jew, God-fearing Jew, I will say that you have to have a, a Jew who keeps the Torah. If he doesn't keep the whole Torah, then he can't be a, a real rabbi. If, he, he can, if he's a conservative rabbi who does not keep all the laws of the Torah, a reformed rabbi who doesn't keep the laws of the Torah, I'm not going to say this is a real rabbi. A real rabbi means that you are authentic. You are keeping the laws of the Torah. You believe in the Torah. You believe in the Torah is given to Mount Sinai. And that's what uh, that's a real rabbi is. So uh, I, I, one time, I don't know if I ever mentioned, I once uh, had the experience. I was on a plane from Florida to New York. I sat down next to a person. I had my yarmulke on. And... Uh, and the man next to me said to me, you look like an Orthodox rabbi. I said, yes. He said to me, well, what I'm going to tell you now, you're going to run away from me because I'm a Reformed rabbi. I said, I said no, I've been waiting this my whole life. I wouldn't, I'm going to run away. I really want to sit next. I want to, I want to talk to you. I want to discuss with you. And I want to understand what Reformed Judaism is all about. I, I take this opportunity. I'm not going to run away. Well, listen, I don't like to talk about people but the man was totally ignorant of, of, of Torah. 
I mean, he used to read a few books from secular people, and uh, he didn't, uh, I'm sure, not from environment like that, but he was really a nice guy. He was a nice guy. I mean, it was, uh, I'm not, I'm, he was very interesting. He was sitting next to his wife, and uh, I said to him, what do you tell a person who comes and says that the relative is dying from cancer? What do you tell them? He said, I don't know what to tell them. I have nothing to tell them, he said. Nothing to tell them. Didn't believe in the world to come. Didn't believe that they're dying, they're suffering. I don't know what to tell them, he tells them. Imagine that. So his wife sitting next to him said, you mean to say that these, these Orthodox people believe that if somebody's on a plane and there's a danger of crashing, you mean they, they, pray, they pray and they think they have some, some... Yeah, they really do that, he says. The Orthodox people, yeah, they believe in that. He was so void of anything Jewish. It was unbelievable. I was so disappointed. I was ready for a nice feisty fight with him, you know, and discuss. There's no one to talk to us. Now. I really was very disappointed. I really... I don't think all Reform rabbis are yeah. anything. I don't... I, I, I hope... Anything. I, yeah. But they're educated mostly from secular books, no, not no, from Torah. Rabbis, rabbis very few. Very few. No, no, they don't believe in... I asked them, do you believe in the Torah from Sinai? He said, well, there was something there. There was something there. I said, guys, come on. Was it, was it or not? But so I asked him, well, there was something. I don't know. There was something. There was something. He tells me. They don't believe it. They don't believe in Tarif Sinai. No? Well, I, I wouldn't say they. I would say the ones who spoke to me. No. Reform, that's the Reformed. It's what, the word Reformed. I'm a Form, Reformed. Reformed. Are. Reformed. Are you a rabbi? Are you a rabbi? No, not a rabbi. It's my rabbi. He's very educated. Very I ask him if he believes in Tarif Sinai. Ask him if he believes Ask him if he believes in it. If he believes in it, how can you not perform? How can you not do it if you believe in it? If Torah is from Sinai, God gave the Torah Mount Sinai, so how can you not uh, uh, keep the laws of the Torah? That's the second question. If he believes in it, why doesn't he, believe, why doesn't he uh, do the, the laws of the Torah? Well, I've met people who are not Orthodox, who are very Why are they reformed then? They're not reformed if they practice and observe. They, yeah, they, they, well, they are. They reform. Okay. They reform. Okay. I'm wonderful. I, I'm glad to hear. Okay. I, that's what I, I hope all reformed rabbis to, to practice and observe. It would be wonderful. Mashiach will come tomorrow. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> ask a rabbi if he believes in Torah from Sinai. Ask him. And if he does, ask him why doesn't he practice all the laws of the Torah. Unless he does, okay, he does. But how do we get on that subject about who's a real rabbi or who's a real rabbi? Yeah. Yes. Oh, where's the, the, uh, the, the mic? Where's the mic? Oh, yeah, it was first. We got, sorry, we got something. I don't want to ruin the discussion. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in the timing of the giving of the Torah. So... We had Abraham, uh, Yitzhak, you know, Yaakov, Yaakov's sons. There was so many opportunities to give the Torah. Um, you, know, and almost, you know, maybe if it was given earlier than at that time, you know, at the time it was actually given, maybe it would have avoided some of these problems like slavery in Egypt and, and so on. What, what was the significance of this exact timing versus... A great question, why the Torah was given Seven generations from Abraham, the seventh generation. Moses was the seventh generation. Great, 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 great grandson of Avram Avinu. The answer to that is just the opposite, on the contrary. All of these things were leading up to the Torah. The Torah cannot be given. They were not prepared yet to take the Torah. They had to go through a cleansing period. The Torah is holy. The Torah is pure. The Torah cannot be given to a nation who's not holy and pure. And they had to have all the patriarchs and matriarchs, the great ones that worked on themselves and their genes and the future generations to perfect themselves, purify themselves, to, to, to sanctify themselves in order for one generation to the next generation. And finally, the bondage in Egypt is called Kur HaBarzal. The Torah called, that's the furnace the oven, the, the blasting furnace, which is made to purify gold and silver. They t take the gold and silver, put it in this blast furnace, it takes all the impurities out, and makes pure gold, pure silver. 
That's what the Jewish people had to go through those years of, of slavery to purify them, sanctify them, to, in order to go through the pain of, of, of Egypt. They, after that, were prepared, after a seventh generation, to accept the Torah. You can't say it would have avoided slavery in Egypt. It wouldn't come, could, not, could not come to the Torah without slavery in Egypt. It had, that, that was a preface in order to come to this great occasion of accepting the Torah Mount Sinai. So all those generations were in preparation to get the Jewish people ready for accepting the Torah. Well, was pain part of that preparation? Yes. Going through the bondage, the slavery of Egypt was part of it. Yes, definitely. Pain, suffering, is purification. It takes away the, like you said, the impurities of the gold, the impurities of the person's uh, 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 physical, mundane uh, uh, parts of him that takes the spirituality of a person into the limelight and puts down the uh, physical and, and mundane part of him into uh, m minimizing that to a great extent. So that was necessary for, for preparation for it. What? Oh, yes. Rabbi, uh, I understand the Torah was exist before the world was exist. Right. And God created the world according to the Torah. Right. Following question from Mordechai Chaimzen. He wants to know, the Ravens, you said earlier that there were priorities in Staka, in yes. charity. He wanted to know, he gets solicited by all sorts of different places, hospitals, schools, places that do outreach, Kirov organizations, all sorts of uh, Chesed organizations and all sorts of, uh, and all sorts of yeshivas and girls' schools and everything else. He wants to know where should somebody give his, put his money? What's the winning horse? Well, that's an age-old question that we all have. We're all bombarded by all kinds of letters and uh, requests for charity, like he says. Uh, some people uh, answer all of them, put a dollar in for each one that they get, and um, others feel that uh, by doing that, nobody's getting too much altogether. They'd rather make a difference in a certain organization. So uh, what really a person should do is uh, pick an organization that's close to his heart and feels that it's uh, something that he wants to be involved with. Uh, it's best to choose an organization that has Torah study connected to it. And poor people, those two things, Torah study and poor people, those are the best ones to get involved with. If somebody is uh, a, a person of means, so naturally he could spread out his uh, donations to all the different organizations, naturally, that uh, uh, all use his help. But if he's a person of, of meager means and doesn't have to, can't give out too much charity out, the best thing is to give it to an organization of Torah and poor people. Because we believe the study of Torah gives a strong abundant blessing coming from God to the world. That is the most, uh, the best way to bring God's abundance of blessings through the study of the Torah. So therefore, by study of Torah that we support, so the poor people become richer, the sick people become healthier, and uh, the people who don't have a uh, mate in life will get one, because study of Torah gives a God to give a, a great abundance of blessings to the world. So. The best thing is to try to uh, give your money towards as, as an organization of study of Torah and, and, uh, and where the people there are not people of means who, who could use that, the, 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 the support for them to keep studying Torah diligently. That would be the best thing to do, to put uh, mostly money. Naturally, a person has local uh, uh, obligations. A person belongs to a certain shul, Naturally, you have to give money to the shul if you have a certain, uh, you live someplace and uh, you have a connection to a certain organization. You have to uh, support your local organization. But getting in the mail that they're not local, so that's something. If somebody comes to your house for a donation, you have to give them something also. So if a poor person asks for money, you have to give them, so you have to respond. 
But as far as the being bombarded by all the organizations, that's the best ones to, to keep in mind. Somebody wants to know if there's a problem with speaking Lashon Hara about a Jewish a public figure of a Jewish, politi a, a Jewish politician or somebody else that is a very public, that's in the public eye um, and who may open himself up to criticism just by, you know, is he, is there some, I guess the somebody who goes into the public, public sphere forfeit his, uh, his protection? <laughs> I mean, you're allowed to speak uh, uh, against his policies. Not be, it shouldn't be personal. And as he might uh, believe in uh, uh, raising taxes, and you don't want, we don't believe in raising taxes, so you say, what's the matter? You, know, you don't agree with him. You don't have to agree with all his, his political policies, but to get personal, you're not allowed to speak personally against him, but nothing to do with him going into politics. To attack him for, you know, he, he did something wrong in the shul that day, so uh, you're not allowed to talk about it. So nothing to do with, him, with, with politics. It's a personal basis. All the laws apply. If it's had to, it was, his, uh, uh, his uh, public life and, and what he's trying to accomplish, and you don't agree with him, so you, you're allowed to voice your, your objection to what he wants to accomplish. That's not called Lashon Hara. That uh, depends on the, what type of thing we're talking about. Personal attacks it, it doesn't make no it doesn't open the door to personally attack him. Not like today's politics, which are disgusting, and they make all kinds of personal attacks on people, and uh, on the president. And it's such a it's a terrible thing for the youth to see that our politicians are, are, are put down such a way that as it gets closer to election, they well, mudslinging and all kinds of personal things, which is totally not Torah type of things. It's supposed to be kept in the high uh, elevation of discussion, of uh, understanding, and not personal. So that's why I answer that person. Any other yeah. comments, questions? Anybody in the room? More online. Okay. Moshe Dov Kranis is a uh, teenager whose chavrusa um, became less observant, has become less observant. He had a chavrusa in yeshiva who went... Um, who Meta chavrusa means tell people chavrusa. His means. study partner in yeshiva became less observant, left yeshiva, and now is in, now has come back somewhat. He's in yeshiva, and the guy wants to keep a connection and friendship, wants to maintain their friendship. And this fellow wants to know how he can maintain that friendship without this friend adversely influencing him. Well, first of all, the question is whether he wants to influence him adversely. Is he out to, uh, if he's out to try to uh, change him? So it depends if he feels weak and feels he might be affected, they shouldn't, uh, shouldn't have uh, a connection to him. But most of the time, the person you're talking about, he came back to she looks like he's looking to, uh, to grow. So by talking to him, I don't see how it would be adversely affected. He came back to Shiva, he wants to grow. So uh, a person depends how a person feels. Uh, if he feels he might be affected, uh, so he should keep away. But most of the time, he won't be affected by him. Uh, uh, he's not a big philosopher who's going to throw at him some kind of, uh, who knows what kind of information that's going to... Uh, have a bad effect upon him. He's just a teenager. So if he's out in drugs and he's doing things he shouldn't be doing, keep away from him. If he's in yeshiva and he's behaving himself, he just has questions, so answer his questions. I don't think he won't be... He's doing a mitzvah. If he's doing a mitzvah, he won't be affected badly. I don't think he has to worry about it. Unless the person's, uh, like I'm saying, he's a no good nick, he's into bad things, so then he should keep away from Okay. Okay, that's it. Okay, everybody. Hope to see you next week. We have a Shabbos with Ura in the zone this week. Still room yeah. left? As of this morning, there were two rooms they said left. So if uh, people want to apply tonight or early tomorrow morning, they can do so. And uh, Maybe uh, bring your informed rabbi to come for Shabbos. <laughs> <laughs>